All right, good morning. I'll let you finish your conversations and get back to your seats. We have a few announcements for you before we focus our hearts on mind on worship. This Wednesday is a Thanksgiving gathering. It's the week before Thanksgiving, and it's mainly so that way we could gather together and worship and have a wonderful meal. We'll be joined by people from Bethesda and Olivet. We'll also be joined from people from Kids Club. So if you can make it out, it should be a wonderful time. Dinner starts between 5.45 and 6 o'clock. Worship will be at 6.30. You just have to come and enjoy, and it should be a wonderful time. So we hope that you all can join us for that. It's mainly our only announcement. As a reminder, next week is actually going to be our backyard ministry. So I'm just reminding you all that we'll be packing bags then so you could plan maybe to stay a little bit after worship next Sunday to help with that. I know, it's already the end of the month. That seems crazy, but we're almost already through November, which means Christmas is right around the corner, though, so that's also fun. Today we focus our hearts and minds, though, on closing the book of James. We have read through the entirety of it today, and today we're going to reflect upon some of the truths and takeaways from the series itself. So today, our songs are ones that reflect upon that nature. A lot of these are more, more contemporary songs that we learned along the way, so I hope that you enjoy those with us as they focus our hearts on how God has been moving us throughout the book of James. So would you join me in that very thing? May we come together and worship by focusing hearts in prayer. Lord, I thank you that we could gather this day that there is sunshine to push away the fog, I pray that if we may be ill or there might be darkness or troubles in our lives, this morning would be rejuvenating for us. I pray that you would fill our lives with your spirit, that we would stand in your presence and know you are near to give us strength to persevere. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So would you please stand and join me in singing our first song, Less Like Me. But just don't get it right Where I talk the talk that I don't walk And miss the moments right before my eyes Somebody with a hurt that I could have held Somebody with a hand that I could have held When I just can't see past myself Lord, help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith. A little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. But even at my best, I must confess, I still need help to see the way you see. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped, somebody with a hand that I could have helped, when I just can't see past myself, Lord, help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, Goodness, love, and faith. A little more like patience. A little more like peace. A little more like Jesus. A little less like me. Oh, to be the beggar on the street. Love to be your hands and feet. Freely give what I receive. Lord, help me be. I want to put you first above all else. Love my neighbor as myself. Live every moment no one sees. Lord, help me be. A little more like mercy. A little more like grace. A little more like patience. Goodness. 
love and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, oh, a little less like me, a little more like living everything I preach, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. Recognizing that these are the truths in our lives, that we are called to be more like Jesus. Our confession today is a reflection of that nature, what it means to be the church in this world. You may be seated as we come together for that. What is the church? The church is the people of God, powered by the Spirit of God guided by the Word of God, working for the glory of God. This is the church. The church is not just a place. The church is the people. The church is not just a monument. It's a movement. The church is not just a building. It's a body. The church is not just an accessory. It's a necessity. This is the church. The Bible says the church is the hope of the world the salt of the earth, and the city on a hill. The church is the family of God, the body of Christ, and light in the darkness. The church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. The church is where all kinds of people from all kinds of places come together to forsake their sins and to worship their savior. Where chains are broken and broken hearts are put back together, where prodigals come home and captives are set free. This is the church. Where blind eyes are opened and good news is preached. Where the low are lifted up and the proud are brought low. Where the lost are found and the helpless find help. Where brothers and sisters can find love and acceptance from each other and from their Father in heaven. This is the church. Where the disciples of Jesus are built up in their most holy faith. The church is where the gospel is. The church is where grace is. The church is where God is. The church is you. The church is me. The church is all of us. This is the church. pray with me? Lord, may these things be true. May they guide us in our hearts and minds and our lives. I pray that we would be the church, that we may rest in this moment, to feel your presence, to know that this is real and true, that we are the people of God, and that you are the one that makes these things possible. Amen. Would you stand and join in singing with me? We knew a while ago, Waymaker.
I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. recognize that we are called to follow after him. And so our next song is one of our powerful hymns that we call upon in our Christian faith, Be Thou My Vision.
You may be seated. Recognizing that all that God has done for us in our lives, the power that he holds, the fact that he is the one that can make all things possible. Are there any joys or concerns to be shared this morning from the congregation today? Sherry. That's right, and Jamie's is right around the corner, I think. Yes. Yeah, so happy birthday tomorrow. Any other? Yes. Community chorus. We'll pray for good health for all the singers. Yeah. Did you have your hand? Prayer for Helen Marcus. Helen Marcus. Bill. Oh. We will definitely play for Rick then. It's Rick, right? Yeah. Any others? <clears throat> Seeing none then, would you join me in prayer? Gracious and holy Lord, we gather this day, standing in your presence. Of all things that we might do, whether we join in person or online, that is the truth that we seek, for we need you in our lives. We need to know that you are God. Amidst the trials that we face and the joys that we have, we need to know that you are God. That there is a Savior for us, that all the things that we face, that you will help us persevere, and in the end, that your glory will shine forth against all the wrongs that we see. Even when we may not think it's possible, even when we may not feel it in our hearts, help us to know it to be true. Help us to hold on to these things. Help us to have hope. Remind us that we were a people who were once dead but now live, and that if that miracle is possible, all others are as well. That you are a God who raises us from the dead, that gives us eternal life. So what else might we think is impossible? Why would the church turn aside and let things be when we know that you could make all things true? So we pray that you would build your kingdom, Lord. That you would give us patience for those that we need to be patient with. Graceful for those that we need to be graceful with. Loving for those that need to know love. Help us to be a people that also, though, stand up for justice. Help us to be a people that know how to discipline our hearts and our minds and our bodies and to be there for those that need us to open our hearts and our homes and our churches. Help us to be a place and a kingdom that changes this world, Lord, to be the people of God. Let this be what rests in our hearts and minds each day, that guides our steps, that speaks the words from our mouths. May you be the one that does these things, Lord. Help us to rest in your grace, to know that we are forgiven, to know that you are God. Nor there is much in this world that we need to pray for, the politics and the wars. There is much, though, that is close to home. We need not look far but the neighborhoods around us to see those who are in need. So we pray, Lord, for where you've planted our church, to focus our ministries and the time that you've given us to do it. Help us to be there for the lost and the wounded and the weary, for the Samaritan on the street that others keep passing, for the homeless, for the incarcerated, for the sick, the shut-in, Lord, we pray that we would be there for them. We pray, Lord, that where there is sorrow or sickness or suffering today, your spirit would bring healing, miracles, and change. That our prayers would be done not as just simple words, but things that we believe can happen. So we pray that you'd guide our hearts. We lift up the many things on our prayer list, that they would come through healing and strength. We pray for these things that are so weighty this morning that have been lifted up. For Andy and Debbie who deal with cancer and the destruction of their own bodies, we pray that your healing hand and the doctors and the medicine would help. We pray for Helen Marcus and we pray for Rick who's been diagnosed with a disease that seems to rob those too young and old. Would you be with him and that you would help? 
We pray for health for our community and the chorus that will be singing songs. We thank you for blessings in our lives, for the names that have come off our prayer list, for those who get to see another year of Patty and Jeannie. We pray for all these things, Lord, resting in your name and strength. So we lift up to you those things that weigh on our hearts, those things that push on our souls that we need you to help us carry. For all these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is not due to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the children come forward? Yep. Just you. I know you've made friends, but you got to come up. I know. Right over there. Thank you. You all did a good job sitting where you were today. You guys were good here. You were with mom. Thank you so much for sitting still today. So we're finishing up our sermon series on James. Next week, we get to talk about Thanksgiving. And then after that, we're into Christmas. But before we get there, we're going to talk a little bit left of James. So I'm not going to talk about Christmas. You got to wait for that. I know. Exciting. We're back to James, though. Is there anything that you remember that we talked about these past few weeks? I'm curious. Has anything come to mind when I tell you about that? Alicia, you can give that to him. Yep. Thank you. I know it was right there. Anything come to mind of what we talked about? What would you say was one big concept in the book? Yes. To reach up to God. To reach up to God? Yeah. Mm-hmm. In, in prayer? Yeah. What do you think? Be, be nice? Mm-hmm. Listen? Well, here's the trick. There was a lot of rules that we kind of went through, right? Basics, you know, have faith, pray, be kind, be generous, trust in God, all these different concepts. But they all boil down to this simple thing. Be nice, exactly. They all come down to the same thing. What we're all trying to do here at church and what we're trying to do in our lives is be like Jesus, yeah? See, when Jesus walked on this world with us, he was nice, he was graceful, and he loved us. And all we're really trying to do, and all James was writing about, is trying to help us do the same thing. Yes. After Christmas is Easter. After Christmas is Easter. It's a few more months. But yes. <laughs> yes. It is true. So I have a question. How do you think Jesus would want us to be nice? What are ways we could be nice? Be kind. Okay. How do, can we be kind? What are things we can do? Simple things. How are you nice? Do you guys do nice things all the time? Yeah. Face this way. There you go. Nothing? You're never nice? Oof. It's going to be... Oh, you are? Okay. I was getting worried there. You come to church every week and you... Yeah. Okay. What about sharing toys? Is that nice or not? Okay. Listening to teachers? Playing together? Right? Inviting someone that you might not play with normally? Giving a hug? Okay. Or if the brother doesn't want it. Uh-huh. These are all different things. Listening to your parents? Listening to me, listening to the people in here. Mom and Dad. Yeah. These are all things that we're trying to be nice. And when you get older, guess what? And Grandma and Grandpa. Yep. Though I think they let you break the rules more than I do. So when you get older, the thing is, there's even more ways you can be kind and nice. Because as you get bigger, there's more you can do. But even if we're not nice, guess what? Jesus still loves us. And he loves you. And that's all James is trying to let you know. Mm -hmm. So could you pray with me today? Dear God, help me be like you. Amen. All right, you're going to go down with Miss Diana and James today. Here you go. Yep. Here you go. Here you go. Oh, it's right here. It's right there. There you go. All right. Well, as a conclusion to the book of James, I was wondering what scripture I would want to draw from. 
Uh, we don't tend to just, well, I don't tend to just preach on a topic and then not have any scripture related to it. And in many ways, I felt the opening of the book in some capacity encapsulates what the heart of this will be. And so it's only these first four verses, and particularly it's the last verse. So when I read this today, I want you to really think and dwell on verse 4. So listen now to these words from James, chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face various trials, consider it all joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and that endurance complete its work so that you may be complete and whole, lacking in nothing. This is the word of the Lord for us this day. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words that I speak this day be glorifying to you. I pray that as we come to the conclusion of this wonderful book you've provided us, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you would help us to live into the truth of who you are in our lives. I ask these things in your holy name. Amen. I almost forgot I need to connect my phone. Oh. I mean, I don't have to, but it makes things much easier. If I don't get there, I don't actually need the slides, so it'll be okay. I got it, Jim, don't worry. We have walked through the book of James, and we have been there for quite a while. And so, my general thesis has been that we are going back to basics. It has been the underlying thrust of the entirety of this sermon series, has it not? Every week, I've described to us various ways that the basics of our faith are there to help us. The underlying question, though, behind that, behind me walking through these basics, behind what James is presenting at play here is this. How are you? How are you? But beyond even asking how are you, that question has an intent behind it, because in asking, I'm guessing that when I ask that, the answer isn't wonderful, Pastor. I'm guessing the answer is more like, OK, not great, I'm fine. The reason I think that's the answer is because the world's tough. The world that Christians live in is different than the one James was writing to, but it's still tough. And for a lot of people, it's very hard. Now, I'm not assuming that you're unhappy, right? Uh, or that possibly you could be doing great. But that doesn't belie the fact that there are many who are not doing great. It doesn't change the fact that at some point in your life, I can probably guarantee that you won't be doing great. You'll face something you didn't foresee, even if that thing is just old age and your own body betraying you. And suddenly, you're like, it isn't that wonderful, and it is hard. But perhaps right now, you could be dealing with a lot more than just simply that. There's a lot of people struggling physically, from health issues to just monetary issues to the things going on in the world, shelter over their heads, simply getting food, or being warm in this coming season of winter. There's many people struggling with mental issues. There's a lot of people struggling with how to think and how to be well in their own minds. Either they're too angry or they're distraught and they don't have answers to the things that are going on. And there's many dealing with spiritual unwellness, whether they realize it or not. As a people, churched or unchurched, Christian and non-Christian, there are points in our lives where we find ourselves discouraged, apathetic, Lacking focus. Perhaps you're lacking energy. You're hurt. You're troubled. You're afraid. You're angry. You're confused. You're worried. You're addicted. You're distraught. Mourning, etc. And this series put forward that an answer to all of that is found in Christianity. And the answers don't actually have to be complex. We listed through James 11 helpful things for us to look at and know that are basic to the Christian faith that we pursued 
to help us find grounding. And there they are. Those were our 11 things. Faith, standing in Christ alone, being doers and not just sitters, not showing favoritism, having an active faith that doesn't just let us sit and be, but drives our faith into reality, wondering what it is that we speak. For the words we say have more power than we might think. How are we to be content? How are we to be a friend of God? How do we do good in the world? Particularly comes from the wealth we have. Where is our mindset meant to be? A vision into the future. And finally, prayer. But to surmise all of these, to encapsulate this series, I want to argue that the basic point of all of this is to simply say, you can live. You can live. Now, what do I mean by live? Because that might seem, yeah, Pastor, I'm alive. Great. But I'm not just talking about being alive. I'm not, not just talking about getting from this day to the next day. Because that's what many people are simply doing. They're trying to just simply get to tomorrow. And a lot of people just go through the motions. They go and do things, and they come home, and they go and do things, and they come home, and it gets into a pattern. We become almost like robots sometimes. And for a lot of us in our Christian faith, when we understand a deep and powerful truth, we awake to a different reality. Because when we become a Christian, what we say to live we mean to actually live, to go from death to life. That is the underlying principle in many ways of our Christian faith, that we lived in a state of death before, and now we get a chance to live. And all those things I listed before, all those troubles and those thoughts and those worries, that is death. And as Christians, we have a way that we can live. It's being taken from being broken to healed. From our mud puddle that I've spoken about many a times in this series to cleansed glory. See, when I talk in this way, when I speak of this, it might seem highfalutin, this metaphorical language, like, well, I'm alive, pastor. OK, I get to do things. So, in today's world, when I say the walking dead, unfortunately, we think of zombies. That's just how culture has gotten. If I told you the walking dead, you'd, if you Googled walking dead, you'd get a whole show, and it's a whole thing. But the metaphor is still actually appropriate. Because for a lot of us, and for non-Christians, we're like the walking dead. We move, we consume, but we don't live. We don't joyously get to do great things. We respond to how the world pushes on us, but we're not really enacting great things. We often live in response to the things put on us instead of enacting truth, because God lets us do that. Christianity is about waking up. Christianity is about coming alive. And the basics that we walk through this series Help us to live that when the world tries to keep you dead. What are the things keeping you from living? What are the things in your head stopping you from hoping? What are the things filling you with the wrong stuff? The world will sometimes work in our favor, and sometimes it will not. And as Christians, I believe that more and more we witness that evil and sin and human pride and brokenness often has their say in people's lives more than good, primarily because the answer for them, the hope for them, the good for them is purposely being obfuscated. It's being hidden. It's being drowned out by all the noise. Because the evil of this world doesn't want people to come alive. Because if Christians actually were alive, if people lived, things would be different. But they're not. Because we like to sleep. 
and evil wants to still say it's one. As the church, as people of God, our job is to help people live. Not just survive, not just exist, but live. It's different than everything else. When you're a Christian, you get to actually live, even when things seem to be pushing against you, even when you face these trials and issues, you get to still live. We get to grow and become and be the people of God. We get to become like Christ. Underlying all of this, the basics here, the truth we talked about, what James said in that final verse 4 was to finish what was started. And what was started in you was becoming like Christ. Guaranteed, at the end of every one of your lives as a Christian, when you pray to God to be saved, when you know that Jesus died on the cross for you, that you get that, at the end of your stories is the guaranteed truth that you're alive in Christ. That all else pales in comparison to that truth. And what we're doing now is making that reality true. Putting aside the ways of death. Putting aside the things that drag us down. There's a quote that I'm going to read from Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis because it speaks to this truth of what I think James is getting at, of what it means to be the church. It is easy to think that the church has a lot of different objects, education, building, missions, holding services, just as it is easy to think the state has a lot of different objects, military, politics, economic, and whatnot. But in a way, things are much simpler than that. The state exists simply to promote and to protect the ordinary happiness of human beings in their life. A husband and wife chatting over a fire, a couple of friends having a game of darts in a pub, a man reading a book in his own room or digging in his own garden. That is what the state is there for. And unless they are helping to increase and prolong and protect such moments, all the laws, parliaments, armies, courts, policies, economics, etc., are simply a waste of time. Now. In the same way, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. God became man so that we might finally stop being simply men. God became man so that we could stop playing at life and actually live, pretending to be grown-ups when really a lot of the time we just still feel like children trying to figure things out, rolling around in the mud, when there's a world of wonders out there for us, we were made to be much, much more. We're told that before the foundations of the world were laid, God knew you and destined you for glory. Not just as humans, but as spirit-filled, God-living, divine-touched, many Christs. And yet, we like to just live in our mud. We like to think we're doing good. But I think the metaphor is apt. How many people out there building mud castles, dirt buildings, playing in the sandbox, getting covered in filth and grime, think that's how things are supposed to be. And they haven't heard that there's a beach right next door they could play at, a forest to explore, cities to build, 
lives to heal, love to know, because they haven't heard. Have you heard? Do you know? If the answer to my question earlier, how are you, is anything less than wondrous, then come in and sit a while. Take a breath in the presence of God. Go ahead. Breathe. Know that you'll be fine. And more than fine, you're going to be great. Know that all the ills of this world are but fading shadows before the sunrise. The day's going to come when the light shines. And you can get to know that now. In the little things, in the basic things, in every step, every moment, every breath you take, that's what the church is for. That's what the songs are for on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights in all their ways and forms. That's what the live stream, the Bible studies, the kids club, the dinners, Christmas and Easter are for, to help you know that what I speak of is true, to experience it in this moment. Because my friends, unfortunately in the world out there, you don't feel it. But I believe you can hear. I believe you can take a sense and know it'll be fine. So that when you find yourself fading, when you find yourself feeling like the walking dead, you find the world around you to be too much, you can find life again. You can know that it'll be okay because you were meant to live. And if you want that, if you find that you aren't living, Pray to God for it. That's what that Lord's Prayer is for. That's what the Christian prayer is for. At any point, you can do that if you've never been a Christian before. And if you are a Christian, as James puts it, do these things that I've written in my book so that you may be complete and whole, lacking in nothing. What do you need to hear today? What do you need to know? God is there. Take a breath. Come out of your grave and live. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that you would help us to be the church. I pray that when we come together that that would be the truth that we feel and know. That there is something different when we gather with other believers. That sometimes we forget when we're walking in this life alone. So help us know that to be true and let us not hide it. These are the things you told us to not put under a basket. This is why you told us to be a city on a hill. Help us invite people here. Help them to know that it'll be all right. And thank you that in your grace and your love, you made it possible for that to be true. Amen. As we gather together for our time of offering, we respond to the glory and love that God has done for us. I think we'll actually, oh, wait, we got Mary Jane. Never mind. It's not Frank and Frank. It's Mary Jane and Frank. We're good. Let us come together and respond to God in the ways that we can. Today, no matter where you are or what you've done, God has a promise for your life. A promise to prosper you. A promise to give you a hope and a future. And a life filled with abundant hope and joy everlasting. See, the promises of God are available to all of us each and every day of our lives. God promises to be with us no matter what. To never leave us or forsake us. To walk with us. And that his word would be a light onto our path. 
In times of destruction and despair, he promises to walk with us. He promises to carry us. His word says that when we are weak, he is strong. Promising to help us shoulder the burdens that come with life each day. And Jesus promises us that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, what God has prepared for those that love him. But above all, but above all, but above all, Jesus promises life, eternal life, for those who believe in him, who call upon his name, who know his heart, and hear that still, small voice. Jesus came and lived and died and rose again to give us this greatest promise. So today, may you stand on the truth of his promises, for they are true yesterday, today, and forever. pray with me. Lord, we ask that these offerings would go to build your kingdom, to be a light in the darkness. May your blessings shower upon them to make them do more than we could ever see possible. Amen. Our final song was one that we started at the beginning of this series, and there's times that I feel that there's really good hymns that apply, and I feel like there's times that there are modern songs that speak to deep truth. And this particular song, while it is still newer for a lot of us, I think speaks very clearly about the truths that we talked about today. So sing with glory, sing with power, for this song is the very thing that we need in our lives. dark and all alone growing comfortable are you too scared to move and walk out of this tomb buried underneath the lies that you believed safe and sound stuck in the ground too lost to be found you're just asleep and it's time to leave Come on and rise up, take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus, you're brand new. The power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus. Rise up, rise up. Out from the grave like Lazarus When he said your name The thing that filled your veins Was more than blood It's the kind of love that carries sin away Now the door is open wide The stone's been rolled aside The old is gone, the light has come So come on and rise up Take a breath, you're alive now voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus. You're brand new. The power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Rise up. Rise up. Out from the grave like Lazarus. Out of the dark, He's given us new resurrected hearts. He's calling us to walk out of the dark. He's 
giving us new resurrected hearts. Come on and rise up, take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus, you're brand new. The power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus. Rise up. Rise up. Out from the grave like Lazarus. Rise up. That's the simple truth I want you to hear today. And it's a glorious truth. It's a wonderful truth. If you come away from the sermon today feeling down, that's the opposite. You should have a pep in your step. You should want to dance. You should know this to be true. Rise up. Live. You can. You can. So go. In the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore.